Um, so hi everyone, uh, good afternoon and good morning in, in UK. Um, so this is our uh, eighth webinar held by uh, Computational Social Science Laboratory at CHK. Uh, so I'm Jamin Lee, uh, I'm an assistant professor in sociology department at the CHK. Um, today, we are very happy um, to invite Professor Matt Ryan. Um, he's an associate professor in governance and public policy at the University of Southampton. Matt is a co-director of the Center for Demographic Features, and he's also leading webinar, Web Science Institute that aims to bring in social technical expertise to explore the development of the web. Um, so Professor Ryan is interested in understanding how people can have more power over public decisions, which is a very important topic across all the world. Um, and I, I personally looked at his profile and, and feel that his research is really orient toward, oriented toward like problem-solving science. In particular, he focuses on democratic innovations. Uh, in this spirit, his work often involves the stakeholders from government and civil society and addresses how and when citizens can and should take part in collective decisions. So it's just like citizen participation uh, in implementation and monitoring of political decisions as well as you know, how we formulate policy that way. So, and he recently wrote a book, Why Citizen Participation Succeeds or Fails uh, by Bristol University Press this year and has been very prolific uh, in publishing work in established journals like European Journal of Political Research, Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Policy, Politics, among others. And, and on, the, on the right, uh, so Dr. Raphael Master is a co-author of today's talk. Uh, he's a research fellow at the University of Southampton. Um, his research is explicitly interdisciplinary and he's a uh, computation social scientists working to solve uh, interdisciplinary problems in the uh, areas of political science and computer science. So today they will talk about how natural language processing and data science techniques for uh, multimodal analysis can model these causes, arguments, facts, and emotion to innovate our uh, political deliberation. So please join me in welcoming um, these two awesome scholars um, and flow is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, very kind words, uh, Jamin. And um, we're just going to uh, launch a presentation now. So uh, it was really nice to hear, hear, hear you say that because um, uh, effectively, uh, it's a really good um, introduction to the, the project that we're both working on. So um, we're working on a UK research and innovation funded project called uh, Rebooting Democracy. So you can see the URL there if you want to ask, ask more questions. And what we're going to do today is try to introduce you a little bit of background about what we're doing in the, in the project and various different examples of the computational social science projects that we've either published or are working our works in progress that we're working on. So hopefully it will spark some interesting conversations and, and questions uh, uh, later on. So uh, the first part, I'm going to speak a little bit about the research puzzles that we're interested in and what the overall framework for the, the work that we're doing uh, in Southampton at the moment is. So I suppose there's a few kind of classic research questions that people who study democracy like me tend to ask. So we tend to ask questions about who is involved when in collective decisions and how they're involved. So one of the kind of key questions, and these are classic questions that people have asked for thousands of years, uh, what is effective political participation? So how do we give people the capacities to be able to participate in the right ways in, in politics? Another important question is what the role, what are sometimes called ordinary citizens, um, that is citizens that are included for no other reason than they are citizens. Their expertise is that they look at their local area and they know what's going on and they have some input and some expertise because they can see what's happening. What role can they play and what role should they play in making collective decisions and informing uh, decisions? And interesting questions about who has both voice and vote. So obviously, sometimes we can vote for representatives to make decisions for us, but also maybe we want to actually have a voice and, and, and create our own arguments in the public sphere. Uh, so those are some of those classic questions and they've been answered in different ways throughout history. 
Uh, and some of the more interesting questions recently are about how we provide opportunities for citizens to gain enlightened understanding of collective problems and solutions. So what we want uh, in, in good government systems is to have citizens who are informed so that they can maybe have good information to make decisions, uh, good information on decisions that are made about them. And uh, this comes to understanding uh, at what speed we make decisions. So sometimes like in a pandemic, you've seen we need to make very quick decisions to try and save people's lives. Other times making decisions too quickly is problematic because we don't incorporate all the potential information or we might need to aggregate information very quickly. So there's obvious potential roles for machines and for computation in, in, in helping to answer some of these classic questions. Uh, a democracy at the moment are democratic forms of rule. It's worth saying that in world value, so if you look at world value survey data, uh, most people still think the idea of democracy in the sense that um, people should be the authors of, of, of laws is it's still the most popular form of rule worldwide as an idea, but as a practice, it, it's not so popular. So we see declining uh, trust in government across the world, and we see various other challenges. So some of them are, are that healthy skepticism of uh, what, what decision makers are doing uh, sometimes becomes absolute disaffection with um, the whole system of government. And obviously that's problematic for um, order and trust in institutions. And uh, sometimes opposition becomes real polarization and mistrust. So in the UK, for example, we've seen this particularly around uh, issues like uh, uh, leaving the European Union, where people are, are, are very um, orientated not to um, believe or discuss what others of a different opinion are saying. Uh, and, and it can translate into some forms of hate as well, which obviously we don't want. But on the other hand, what I've been studying over time is um, kind of uh, these new opportunities for different types of innovations in collective decision making. So some of these might be um, uh, familiar to people, some might not. Um, things like citizens' assemblies, where often a random selection of people are, are brought together to um, uh, you know, exclude maybe the usual suspects who are always making decisions from the decision and get a representative sample of opinions in decision making. Or things like participatory budgeting, where people who are experts in what's happening in their local area can uh, get together in uh, local assemblies and inform and vote for delegates who can then um, implement and spend city budgets and municipal budgets in perhaps a more effective way. Or various types of referenda or preferendum, as they call, where people can rank order their, their, their ideas. And those are just some examples of innovations. And they're often now supported by civic technologies and computational technologies, which we'll talk a little bit about at, at the moment. So one of the other projects that we partner with and that, that I'm involved with as a co-oi is the Participedia.net project, which is trying to crowdsource examples of democratic innovations from around the world where you can see case studies of different innovations. So it's worth checking that out, but I'll talk a bit more about that um, later on. But this is the effectively what we see as the, the, the world that we're working with and, and that we're trying to understand. So democratic innovations are, are fairly uh, uh, new in some senses, this idea of involving citizens in decision making, but actually uh, kind of innovative ways of selecting rulers are not that new. So this is an example uh, of uh, how decision makers and juries were selected using this machine uh, in um, ancient Athens. Uh, so effectively, this was a, a, a machine for selecting by lot uh, juries to make uh, uh, political decisions often. And uh, even though um, probability theory hadn't been uh, in, really invented, the, you know, the Athenians had some sense that uh, random selection might be a good way of making equal, uh, equal capacities for decision making and, and, and kind of making sure that everyone from different tribes had the same um, potential for selection for decision making. So it's just one example from it, from it, from ancient societies of, of a kind of a, an innovation using a technology, if you like, of the time. Uh, it's important to know that doing these things has made a difference in various parts of the world. So on the top here, we have uh, uh, pictures of, of, of street paving in Brazil as a result of participatory budgeting. On the bottom here, we have examples of a citizens' assembly in Ireland, which led to changes to the Irish constitution. So these are just typical examples of some uh, uh, ways of doing 
governance slightly differently that have led to interesting results, let's say, that have changed people's lives in important ways. So what, as political scientists or social scientists, when we study contested and interesting social concepts like democracy or justice or whatever they may be, we, are we, we usually have various different data sources. And traditionally, they might have involved theories about what democracy is or should be and other social theories, which are completely necessary as always. We might have used in-depth case studies and like really thick descriptions of political events, classic things like public opinion surveys since the 1950s and 60s and 70s, census data, administrative statistics, and also texts, legal texts, parliamentary records, and news media. And these have been maybe the traditional data sources of political science. But what's happening with the uh, increase in computing power over the last number of years is that we have similar data, but we think new opportunities accommodating all of these traditions of research. And that's what we want to talk about a bit more today. But what we want to say is that it's really important to see that these different types of data or these, these data do not preclude more pluralistic ways of, of, of thinking and, in, and, and kind of interdisciplinary theories. We were just talking about this before we kind of came on air about the different the different disciplines that are contributing together to uh, good science at the moment and good social science. The, opp the opportunities for civic technologies and the influence of design sciences, um, which has meant that the theory that we're using is slightly of a different kind. Also, we might have case studies, but we have opportunities for crowdsourcing of cases like I just showed you with Participedia and the ease of classifying qualitative data that comes with um, uh, increased computing power. And we'll say a bit about that in our examples in a moment. We also have a rise of randomized control trials and survey experiments, which is, gives the potential for meta analysis, which we, we're doing quite a bit of. And then we have the huge data exhaust produced by social media and online discussion, the semantic web, audio and video classification. And we'll go into some of what we're doing uh, with some of these techniques and technologies in the talk. Um, I just wanted to point out a little bit that our interest in is as much in data science for democracy as it is in democracy for data science. So sometimes you hear a lot in the public sphere about people being scared of algorithms or computational social science or machines and computing. And this is rational to some extent, uh, although what we want to point out is that there's some, uh, we, we don't need to be too scared about the algorithms or about the technology. The technology is only scary when people are using the technology without actually engaging with the social science and not understanding society in, in, in the right way. So it's really important that we bring social science and computer science together. And that's why uh, uh, giving the opportunity to speak to a lab like yours, which is trying to do this, we feel is really great opportunity. So what we're trying to do in the project is try to improve and help decision makers and civil society and other actors uh, with this question of what to consult on when. So we know that, for example, a lot of major cities have dashboards that provide basic information about current state of the city and demographics. So we can present lots of different modules of information to people in easy to, to view formats. We can use social networks to discover what people care about and what they're talking about. So kind of trend predictions in, in, in and again, these are computational um, methods that can help with decision making. We can look at emotion and sentiment around these topics, whether people are positive or negative about what's happening in different, par in different parts of their lives. So that's a way that, comp that kind of computational work can help doing the social science that often happens before decision making to inform decision making. We can also, and we'll talk a little bit about this, use um, uh, lessons from computer science and, computa and computation for uh, aiding decision making when people are deliberating. So for example, we're looking at how we can use argument mapping that is structuring an argument and seeing uh, what the different premises and claims for different arguments are to help people understand the arguments that they're making when they debate with one another. We can also look at fact checking, which is something that people would probably be aware of, uh, which, you know, we can automate um, how, uh, wh whether we can see and link evidence to claims that are being made in the public sphere. And we can extract information online in interesting ways to disambiguate um, uh, between different claims and premises and different types of evidence. And then after that kind of decision making moment, we can also use computers for summarization tools to explain uh, what we've done and what effect it's had to visualize them again on, on dashboards or on, on websites 
and to track issues and we can see lots of civic technologies that do this so a, a typical example is fix my street where it's much easier for um uh, people to um report problems with their street potholes or whatever it is to governments through uh, uh these kind of systems and and and, and see whether uh, action is taken um, to, to fix issues locally. Um, all this, of course, requires multi and interdisciplinary approaches, and that's why we feel that um, uh, computational social science is really interesting domain to work in because it brings together uh, groups that don't normally talk to each other that much. So it's still actually quite rare for computer scientists, statisticians and mathematicians, uh, even though we might do it and, and the people on this call might do it, it's still quite rare for that to happen. And it's still quite powerful when we bring these different disciplines together in different ways. So I'm going to hand over first to Rafa and then he'll hand back to me. But what we want to do for the rest of the talk is give you some examples of the computational democracy studies that we've been doing. And hopefully we'll get some questions from you after. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again for having us here. Uh, as, Matt, as Matt said, I'm going to start giving an example of how we can use different technologies that are not normally used in, in these fields to, to improve how uh, the analysis or, or, or the studies that we make in, in, in political science. So first I'm going to talk about crowdsourcing. Uh, crowdsourcing it might be a thing that's been used in many fields for a long time, but it's still not that common that it's used in political science and social science, because we know that one thing that's uh, crucial in this field is to code data in order to obtain well, to do statistical analysis and do all sorts of analysis after that. But uh, one of the um, premises of crowdsourcing is like, can we use the knowledge of the crowd? It's like what people uh, think, people that might not be experts about these topics, what they think to replace the classical coding that we use in social science. And this might be very helpful to create large scale data sets that could then be used, well, to, to, to understand what, what things happen in and what people think about certain issues. But we might ask ourselves, how useful are these data sets? And can we actually trust the judgment of people when they're doing uh, all these uh, coding? One example that we want to talk about is argumentation. So argumentation is a field, uh, mainly philosophy at the beginning, that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I started with Aristotle and his rhetorics that tells you how, uh, how arguments are formed, what are the, uh, the, the, the parts of an argument, how we can use rhetorics and how we can take into account the ethos, the pathos and logics of something to come up with a conclusion when we are in a deliberation. And what I want to show here is that it has come through a very long uh, path and this is just like a couple of examples that have been influential from Aristotle to uh, the new rhetoric, the Talmud's uh, framework, and recently uh, Douglas Walton, and even some more normative theories that have uh, given rise to some uh, discourse quality index that are quite used in, in deliberation studies and so on. So this is a very influential field that has like a very strong baggage of theory behind it, of how an argument should be formed. I want to ask ourselves, how do people understand these arguments and can we use their judgments between in, 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 in what arguments are in order to improve the data sets that we might obtain for argumentation. Uh, so just to explain a little bit what exactly is argumentation, this is a very typical and very simple example is that we have a, a claim or a thesis or a conclusion that might be in this case a rock exists and then we have different premises that they might be supporting or attacking this. So we have here that we can see rocks is a premise that supports the fact that rock exists while uh, this premise that my parents don't believe that rock exists is something that is attacking this claim here. These are the most basic example but they can obviously be more and more complex as this case here from uh, Tolmin's framework in which you then you can have claims, grounds, rebuttal, backing war. You have all sorts of different types of uh, argumentative units that can be linked, linked to each other. And things can get more and more complicated if we use argumentation tools and maps, which starting from some claim here can form all sorts of trees with different premises that are connected with each other and attack and support each other. 
So it can become a very complex thing when you want to map a whole argument to understand what could be a good conclusion that supports or attack the main premise. In computer science, there has been recently a, a subfield, which is argumentation mining, which is basically trying to mine, model, uh, and, 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 and predict arguments from natural text or audio or, or, or people speaking. In order to do this, it is a very complex task that still doesn't have like a, a full answer, so nobody knows how to do it properly. But the main way of doing it would be you introduce raw text, and then you need to find out the argument component detection. So it needs to tell you this is where an argument starts, this is where it's finishing, and then you predict this structure, you classify the structure of this argument. So you tell it, okay, this is a claim, this is a premise, or they're attacking and supporting each other. And then you can form, as I showed before, all these uh, trees or networks of arguments that are attacking and supporting each other. What we can ask ourselves here is, can we use this crowdsourcing to extract the arguments from debates or deliberations? So in this case, as a, as a proof of concept, we use a debate or well, several debates. And what we used was the US 2020 presidential debates between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So these are the sets of debates that you have here. We have two debates from Trump and Biden, two debates that were just uh, answering questions from the audience from, again, Biden and Trump, and finally the vice presidential debate from uh, Pence and Harris. And with this, we built this data set. It's a multimodal argumentation mining data set of these political debates that was using crowdsourcing techniques. So we were asking the people to label these, uh, these debates. This was a relation-based annotation. So what we were asking the people was given two sentences or two utterances from people. What's the relation between them? Are they supporting each other? Are they attacking? Or there's no relation between them. We were including the context so people would know what they were annotating. So they, they would know that it was a debate and what was the topic of the debate and what, was, what were the arguments around these two main sentences. And as we will talk about later, it includes something novel in this case, which is including the audio as well, to build a machine learning model finally to classify all these things. So this is just an example of what this crowdsourced annotation might look like from the point of view of the annotator. So first we give them an introduction, consider these two following sentences from the debate, we're discussing families, and then we give them two sentences that were uh, uttered by Joe Biden in this case. Then we give them a short context with the two sentences highlighted. So they have to read this and then they need to basically annotate and tell us what are the relationships, the relationship between these two sentences. Are they supporting each other? Are they attacking each other? Or there's no relationship between them. And finally, it just asks this question, which is how confident are you in your annotation? Because we wanted to get a sense of if they found this very difficult or not, and they were always not confident or they were always very confident. We obviously, obviously had some quality settings here because we wanted obviously to only take the good quality annotations from, from, from the people because it might be people who did not uh, understand very well the task or they were not, um, they were just performing poorly. So we wanted to remove those cases. We had some test questions so that we could uh, test people while they were doing the task and uh, with questions that were already labeled by ourselves. So we could make like a, to give them like a, a trust score to say how much we trust their uh, annotation. And then we could filter those out to say, okay, we only consider people that we trust a lot because they have been answering our test questions very well. We had a minimum time that I had to spend doing this task. So we were, we were sure that they were thinking about it a classification range to make sure that they were not classifying more than 60% of support, more than 35% of attacks, to make sure that people were just not labeling almost the same thing because they were very biased towards a specific one. But also we allow dynamic judgment. So when we were uh, asking uh, the relationship between two sentences, we were asking for three judgments to make an average. But if people were not agreeing with each other, we were increasing this a uh, number of judgment more and more up to seven. So we could get a more, more, more data basically to uh, find out what was the average uh, annotation in, in each case. So in order to figure out how biased were the people and if we could trust the annotations, we used all these metrics I, I was talking about. So here we have the annotation agreement. So this is the average 
uh, annotation score from the people. So here, one means that everybody agreed on the annotation. Zero, well, zero would be impossible, but it would mean that nobody agreed on the annotation. And what we can see, it's interesting, we see that for the attack relations, people tend to agree less. So we see that it's more centered around 0 0.8. While for the other ones, we see that there is generally a little bit of a more of an agreement. So this one seems to be the type of relations that people have more problems with. Then if we look at the trust in the annotation, this can tell us if people are biased towards a specific answer. So this is, uh, as I said before, the uh, how much we trust the annotator to answer their questions uh, properly according to some test questions that we gave them that they were like an exam we we're making. And we see that the distribution is more or less the same for the three labels, which means that they're not really biased to any of the answers. The same with the self-confidence score. So this is something that they, uh, they answer themselves. So it's like, how confident are you in your annotation? And again, we don't see any difference in the type of label, which means that they were more or less as confident uh, answering all all labels in general. So this tells us that they don't tend to be very biased in their annotation, except maybe for the attack relations, they're just a little bit more disagreement, but there's no clear bias in the confidence or in the trust of the annotator. But what did happen is that the annotations provided by people, we see that there, there are two picks, one at like around 400, so there were people who were answering many, many questions and then Another pick at almost zero, which is people who were answering just a couple of questions and then they left and they didn't want to participate anymore. So this gives you a way of like maybe filtering your data and say, okay, we might not want to keep these people here because they were not providing many answers. So we might not trust them, but keep these people who have done like the job for a long time and they, they might have gotten the grasp of it. So continuing on this uh, trust or biasing of the people, what we can compute is the inter-annotator agreement alpha in this case, this is Krippendorf's alpha. So for those who know, this tells you that in this case, this is a low agreement of the annotation, 0 0.43. So we have low, low inter-annotator agreement between the people, meaning that they are not agreeing that much in the annotations. This tells you about the subjectivity of the task and how people uh, are finding in relations that some people might consider support, other people might be considering them attack, or maybe they're just considering not an argument. So it tells you about how people understand arguments and how it might be different from what the theory of argumentation, the logic behind it, or the philosophy behind it tells you how an argument should be. But what we do find out is that if we filter these uh, annotations, maybe by self-confidence, the ones that people were very confident about, and also with the people that were answering their, their test questions very well, we can achieve higher levels of, uh, of inter-annotator agreement, which means that they were just a subset of those questions that they were just very difficult, very subjective, that people were not agreeing on. But when we filter those out and we retain only the ones that are very clear, people tend to agree more. So it tells you that there are like two subsets of, of, of annotations uh, in, in, in this task of argumentation. So crowdsourcing can be used uh, for this purpose, but it, it is interesting because it tells you about how people understand arguments differently from what the theory of argumentation tells you that it should be. Now we'll uh, go back for a while with Matt. Yeah, so I think, so that's a kind of a good first example of uh, work that we've published, which was trying to look at how we could create a data set that annotated arguments. And I think you'll speak a little bit in a while about um, how we're developing that with work in progress. I thought it'd be really nice as well then to provide a kind of quite different example, but also uh, one that builds on some of the issues with crowdsourcing. And, and also what I think is nice about what I'm going to present to you now is that it's kind of an example where more older ideas coming from uh, computer science have been applied to qualitative work in the social sciences. So it's probably something that doesn't come on under um, the kind of big data and data science aspect of computing, but it still shows how computer science can, can, can be used effectively in, in collaboration with social sciences to overcome some of the problems and challenges of, data, of the data that I outlined, outlined earlier. So this is using qualitative comparative analysis. I wanted to show, uh, first of all, going back to, I spoke previously about Practicipedia.net, and this is an old screenshot from a previous uh, version of Practicipedia. But what it shows is that um, it's a map of the world, obviously, and it shows 
the, num the cases that were submitted to the crowdsourcing site in Participedia of democratic innovations and descriptions of democratic innovation. One thing you'll notice is that as scholars, we actually knew that a lot of the best democratic innovations that had happened, like participatory budgeting, had started up in South America. But obviously, because scholars are con and, and kind of knowledge of this stuff is concentrated in maybe in the global north, you see a lot more um, uh, uh, cases being submitted in those areas. So obviously, this is an example of bias in crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing cannot be the answer to, to everything. So what do you do then when you uh, need to answer questions uh, and you do not have that kind of key data? So, th so what I was interested in for this book that I published that was mentioned earlier is about when and how citizens gain control over important decisions, because it's still a fairly rare phenomenon for, for good reasons, maybe that I'll go into, or maybe bad reasons, but we can, that's a debate for another day, I suppose. But um, effectively, that's the question that I wanted to answer in this, in this book. What's the, the puzzle is, when do politicians or decision makers give power to citizens to, to control decisions? So it's an interesting phenomenon that I wanted to explain. And what I noticed was that over time, there have been a lot of uh, books that have come out around uh, and, and, and over time, they've increased the number of cases that they'll study. But for the most part, when a new social thing emerges or a new phenomenon emerges, most people will start off by doing very in-depth ethnographies for good reason, because we don't understand this phenomenon. So we need to go and study it in depth. So the first few books on, on participatory budgeting, which is what I'm going to talk about here, uh, really went into Porto Alegre and people spend lots of lots of a long time living with the people that are implementing PB and trying to understand it and describing it in 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 very detail and and theor um, matching it to social theories. You get people who are looking at very different types of um, innovations who then try and connect theory between these different innovations in, in books like those ones. And then over time, you people start to do comparative studies. So they start to compare one case with another, but they're still using very thick description. Uh, even when they move to doing cross-national studies, like in, in, in these books, or even uh, when we get to having, uh, you know, cases that, uh, studies that compare maybe four to eight to even 12 or more cases. So over time, we see this increase. But the problem is, if you're doing very in-depth work, it's very hard for a researcher to hold all this information in their head, right? They need it. At some point, you need computing power uh, to deal with this issue. So how do we deal with this issue of thick description uh, and very theoretically driven uh, social research, but also wanting to increase the number of cases so we have robust knowledge about how to answer this research question over a larger number of cases? So I just wanted to quickly go through some of the theories in the field, and then I'll look at the methods, and then I'll, I'll kind of explain uh, the outcomes of what we got. So as I said, it's a really interesting social phenomenon because people who have power rarely give it away, probably for good reason. If you have power, you don't feel like you want to see that power. We know that citizens are skeptical and cynical uh, in, in, in many uh, uh, um, uh, countries right now. But we also know that there are ide ideological commitments and concerns about legitimacy of government that mean that politicians actually have good reason to commit to giving people more participation. So it's often used by governors because they feel that they're lacking legitimacy because citizens are skeptical. So they think one solution to that is let's give citizens a bit more power. Um, the, another thing that's uh, in the literature often considered to be a necessary condition for citizen control is the support of the bureaucracy, right? So in many countries, we know that staff, you know, civil servants are key to implementing and making policy. This is old school public administration research, but it really shows that actually a lot of decisions are not made by politicians. They're made by your workers on the ground, whether it's the police or the um, uh, teachers or whoever it is, or the street level bureaucrats. So their freedom to support or their will to support participatory policies or any policies are often crucial to outcomes. So we want to study that as well. A third thing is what civil society are doing. We know that in many cases, democratic gains are, and, and, and gains in human rights or whatever are a response to demands from active organized civil society. But sometimes um, uh, this doesn't seem to be the case also. So there's a, a question emerges about when does that vibrancy and capacity of citizens in society matter for the outcomes of PB? Do they need to hold government to account or whatever it might be? And a final really important variable uh, that tends to come up all the time is, is the financing of projects, right? So obviously there's huge variance in finance available to municipalities that are implementing projects. 
and it's an obvious constraint. Um, and different political systems will provide different circumstances based on whether they're financing a lot of debt or whether they have uh, the ability to raise taxes at a municipal level or something like that. So these were the different variables I was interested in understanding how they contributed to whether our citizens generally get control of a PB or whether it's kind of uh, more a top down decision making um, uh, vessel that, that, that is kind of an empty vessel for participation, like we might say. So as you can see, many of the cases, so what I did was I took the most in the, the cases that I could find the most information for. So I had a kind of a worldwide comparison, which is fairly unique, and I compared 30 cases. So, so it's kind of like a medium number of cases, not really large end, but still what I wanted to do was retain good qualitative ethnographic information, but make it comparable across cases. So to do this, we borrow um, a fuzzy set theory, which comes from, you know, originally from developed by a mathematician and computer scientist as a kind of generalization of, of, of set theory and set mathematics. Uh, and what's really useful here is that uh, obviously here's a classic um, uh, uh, theory of participation in, 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 in governance, which comes from Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Participation, uh, published in the journal. Uh, American, American Planning Association in 1969. And what she has is she's kind of got a model for participation where you think about what, what governments do when they get citizens to participate. And some of which she said is really non-participation, some of it's more tokenistic and some of it is real citizen power. Um, but she has this kind of model and, and this, this famous diagram where everything is kind of on the same level. So you kind of have a kind of fairly clear categorical or ordinal type data uh, um, but that is very difficult to compare across cases in a way that understands what citizen control is. But if we think of citizen control as a fuzzy set, we can think about what is full membership in the set, i.e. citizen control, what is not really in the set, that's i.e. tokenism, so it's less, it's less in the set. If you think of the set on the left as being one being fully a full member of a set of um, cases of, with citizen control and zero being full non-members, things that definitely are not citizen control and participation. And effectively, we can construct these fuzzy sets. It's really a constructivist approach using uh, theory from um, uh, fuzzy mathematics to then think about how we can construct variables um, that make sense for, for very contested concepts. So when I apply that in, uh, this is just an example, and I know this would be small and maybe difficult to see, but effectively, what I've what I've done is mapped out a fuzzy set and given a kind of a code for what's fully in the set of, uh, in this case, participatory leadership. What's fully out of the set, and what's the kind of crossover point at which uh, a case would be more in or more out of a set. And we can get these kind of specific fine-grained um, uh, ways of dealing with uncertainty and 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 dealing with uncertainty between what's in a set or what's not in a set so trying to understand what what is participatory leadership so effectively this is a way of quantifying qualitative data uh, and so i did that for all the cases and all the conditions in my uh, data set so took evidence and coded it uh, in various ways and we get these different set memberships and what it also means is we can kind of consider each case as a combination or intersection of different sets um, and we can comp compute uh, their membership in this intersection, these different types of set, uh, and obviously their membership in the outcome. And this will now allow us to do uh, tests for um, set theoretic relationships among the variables. So we know that in social science, a lot of the time, I think I said this earlier, a lot of the time, the kind of um, uh, uh, hypotheses that we have are not so much the more participatory leadership are the, the more citizen control or the less participatory leadership, the less citizen control, i.e. correlational hypothesis. We also have a lot of what we might call set theoretic hypotheses, which are if X, then Y. So if we have participatory leadership, then we have citizen participation. So sometimes we formulate our hypothesis in that way. And the correct test for that is to use a set theoretic test to see if um, X is a subset or X is a superset of Y. So we can test for necessary and sufficient conditions uh, among cases. So, for example, here I have plotted the um, uh, set memberships in participatory leadership against set memberships in citizen control. And what you see here is a relationship that suggests we have um, uh, that participatory leadership is a necessary condition for citizen control. That is, that your X is almost always greater than your Y. So, you, you, wherever you see participatory leadership, you tend to see citizen control. You don't have many, uh, you, don't, you almost have no cases where you have 
citizen control without seeing participatory leadership. We obviously have so we can investigate which cases do contravene this relationship, but these are mostly cases in this here, like Toronto and Buenos Aires, where you have very little citizen control anyway, or low levels of citizen control. And when you look into the cases, you actually see that you may have citizen control for a short while um, with low levels of participatory leadership, but over time, uh, it doesn't follow through to being uh, high levels of citizen control. Or you might have cases where you have high levels of pattern participatory leadership with very high levels of citizen control. But overall, what this suggests is that you kind of got this 93% consistency of a set theoretic relationship uh, between participatory leadership and citizen control. So again, we can kind of assume or infer from that that participatory leadership is most of the time a necessary condition uh, for, for citizen control, but we can identify the contravening cases for further up case study work to see whether what was actually happening in those cases. Um, the other thing that we can do then is apply some Boolean algebra to be able to think about what are the minimal intersections of sets or sufficient conditions for explaining some of the outcomes we're interested in. So one very useful tool uh, here is a truth table, which basically treats each combination, potential combination of presence or absence of conditions as an ideal type. And we can see which cases fit in the ideal type, and we can understand what kind of types of cases we have examples of in our data, what types of cases we don't have examples of in our data, and especially we can identify which cases are kind of logical contradictions, where we have different outcomes despite them having the same uh, combinations of conditions that occur. Uh, it, so it's more difficult to explain in some ways. Um, and what we do then is apply algorithms, simple algorithms like point McCluskey algorithms to eliminate uh, superfluous explanations and try and come and find minimal sums uh, of expressions that successfully explain are sufficient for um, the outcome. So that allows us to test the previous claims that have been made in the literature with, with single case studies are very small numbers of cases, uh, generalizing over a larger number of cases, in this case, 30 cases. So for example, when we look at the minimal sufficient conditions for citizen control of PV, we can eliminate uh, what the role of civil society to some extent, uh, if we take an inclusion threshold, which is usually, this is consistency of being included in, in, in your um, uh, sufficiency relationship of sets. And we find that it's actually a combination of participatory leadership and bureaucratic support in most in many cases uh, that explains uh, citizen control or a combination of political leadership with the financial basis to spend. I'll say more about this in a moment. And, and, and we can calculate various parameters or measures of fit um, that can help us understand uh, the quality of these expressions in, in terms of explaining the outcome. We can also look at how citizen control is negated. So we find that uh, you know, nine, in kind of 90% of the data supports um, an expression that the absence of political leadership is sufficient for the absence of citizen control. Or similarly, even when we do have strong political leadership, it, do, it doesn't matter if we have a combination, an intersection of the absence of an intersection of three sets. So the absence of civil society demand, the absence of bureaucratic support for projects, or the absence of uh, financial basis for spending. So if you don't have any of these, it doesn't matter how much participatory, how, how, how participatory the leader is, those cases are examples of generally examples of kind of failed or, or not particularly good um, uh, uh, citizen control in participatory budgets. Uh, so to summarize the findings, I mean, we can, if people want to ask more questions about the measures, they can, but to summarize the findings, one thing I found was that in the literature, because people were dealing with very small number of cases, and they couldn't use a method to generalize comparison across, they tended to be too close to the page and understand that they, they thought that almost many conditions that they saw present in good cases, they claimed to be necessary conditions. But actually, when we look across cases, we can eliminate most of those necessary conditions apart from over time, political leaders uh, tend to need to be very strongly in favor of participation over time. So this is pretty close to being a necessary condition or almost always necessary, we might say. Um, more consistently, what we tend to see is that we're all actors, so that's the politicians, the bureaucrats and, and civil society are dedicated. They can even overcome fiscal constraints. So even where you don't have a lot of money for spending, you can get the kind of social capital that runs through all the different actors when working together and um, leading to ideal citizen control. So some of the ideal PB cases, participatory budgeting cases like Porto Alegre, Recife under the PT and some of these other cases are 
they, those are examples where all of these actors tended to come together and work together, even overcoming uh, financial difficulties to implement participatory projects. But we, if we're allowing a little bit of inconsistency, and obviously we can change our consistency thresholds, we actually find that if you're willing to uh, allow some outliers in your data, it's a combination of having a participated leadership and bureaucratic support. So that's kind of a flexible administration. And this happened in these cases, helped implement a good PB, or you might have a lot of money in, in kind of cash rich large cities where you have relatively good fiscal options to raise taxes that also led to successful participatory budgets. So these are two alternative explanations that explain a lot of the cases. We saw in the earlier um, table as well that when what we found was that there's two explanations that are equally good at explaining different cases where PB systems fail. One of them is just a lack of leadership. So when, when you have a lack of leadership, this is sufficient for uh, failure in cases. But the other is a combination of the lack of the, all the other three um, potential explanatory factors. So a lack of bureaucratic support combined with, and only when combined with, a lack of civil society demand and, and autonomous civil society action, and combined with a lack of financial support for projects. So these are two different ways of explaining an absence of citizen control in participatory budgets. Just one final slide on this study is that we were also able to, there is one interesting puzzle which remains. So we have a number of cases where we, where we were able to show strong participatory leadership and uh, strong citizen control, and also cases where we have low participatory leadership and low citizen control. But we have this interesting cluster of cases here, which we haven't quite explained uh, uh, yet, which um, uh, are cases where we have high participatory leadership, but relatively low levels of citizen control. And those are cases where I don't really, I haven't been able to find the data to understand what's going on in those cases. If I add other variables to the model, these cases tend to shift in alternative directions and it's not very clear what's happening. So there is some other explanation out there for why cases where you have strong leaders dedicated to participation still uh, lead to a lack of citizen control, but it's something that we have to uh, move forward on. So these kind of techniques obviously involve interesting use of algorithms to uh, reduce complexity and, and, and increase parsimony in explanations. And we want to extend this work over more cases and like we showed earlier presented as part of a dashboard of evidence for decision makers on how they consult the public where they get information from so then i'm going to i'm going to hand back to rafa and he's going to talk a little bit more about works in progress that we have now and that will bring us through to the q a and discussion so we have seen what ma has been explaining it's more like a large scale analysis of, of these deliberation events or these events, democratic events in general. And we can look at them from a more fine view. And what we find inside most of the times is just deliberation between citizens or debates between citizens and, and, and politicians. So it's very interesting to look uh, with computational uh, comp computer science techniques what how we can analyze all these debates. And what we try to do uh, is do some sort of computational discourse analysis where we have, on the one hand, purely qualitative data, which is text or audio or people speaking, which is usually analyzed by hand by researchers. But we also have purely quantitative data or methods, which are normally not applied for this. Um, we ask ourselves if we can use computational social science to bridge this gap, always drawing from robust theories from argumentation, political science, linguistic, to answer all these questions with these computational methods. So I will uh, talk about how we can use, uh, like I said, these theories to continue working and use computer science techniques to analyze uh, this type of data. And let's start with argumentation, continue from what I was explaining before in the crowdsourcing techniques. We can look at this uh, set of presidential debates. These are the US presidential debates since they were first te televised in 1960 uh, up to 2016. Uh, this was uh, published in a, in, a, in a paper by other researchers that had labeled all of the uh, arguments that were used in these debates, uh, whether they were arguments or not, or they were claim on premises, and they built a machine learning model using natural language processing that could tell, well, that could predict a model or these arguments. What they found using several of these models, but the best one was find, found a really high accuracy of like precision of 88% of recall of 
predicting or finding these arguments once you give them uh, like a sentence and you ask it like, is this an argument or not in a political sense, obviously, because these were all political debates. So it was, it's working pretty well. I wanted to test this uh, model of argument, non-argument classification to another debate. So in this case, we tested on the 2020 presidential debates because this was not part of the data set. Uh, and what we find here is that, okay, we give it a sentence of this debate and then it returns a, a, a score of the, of the argument that can be from zero, which is not an argument at all, to one, which means highly argumentative in nature. This is a histogram of the uh, answers of this uh, model for the four speakers of the debate, Trump, Biden, Harris, and Pence. And what we see is that they tend all of them to have higher levels of, of argument score. So it means that they tend to say many sentences that are argumentative in nature, which makes sense because we are in a debate, while they have a lower amount of sentences that are not arguments, which also makes sense because you cannot say everything that it's an argument. But let's see a little bit how this actually performs in a, from, with a more qualitative view. Let's look at some of the examples of what the model tells you that's an argument. So this is the case with the highest argumentative score. This is a, a statement by Harris that we will achieve net zero emissions by 2050, carbon neutral by 2035. It's a very inter interesting case because if you, if you are a little bit picky about it, it might not really be an argument because it's something very contingent. She's, give, she's saying a promise. She's saying, we will do this. And you could say, okay, this is an argument maybe that supports the notion that the US will be doing really good in climate change issues. But this is contingent that this happens, that the promise is actually fulfilled. So this, even though it's not like a pure argument, this is detecting pretty well the type of like grammatical uh, structure of what an argument looks like. And it's, it's, it's predicting it quite well. And then we have here other arguments, like we need more teachers in our school to be able to open. It's a very clear claim of something that we need to do according to Biden or we were able to see the delivery, the delivery of billions of supplies because our doctors and nurses had the resources they needed. So again, it's also very argumentative. He's giving reasons about something that, that he's claiming. And finally, like another very simple claim, we have to protect our seniors. So this model uh, trained of these previous presidential debates using natural language techniques is actually doing pretty well analyzing and extracting these arguments from a different set. If we look at the other side of the argument score, the ones that are not argumentative at all, then we find very clear examples. Like, let me ask you uh, a question. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. And we have find a couple of interesting examples, which are these two by Trump. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Or, oh, you don't. Which is clearly attacking something that probably Biden said, but it's not really an, an argument. It might be attacking something, but it's not giving a reason. It's not just giving a fact. Oh, you got to be. Uh, I don't agree with you because of this reason. It's very interesting because if you remember what we were, uh, what I was talking about before about the crowdsourcing technique, when we ask people to annotate the relation between these kind of sentences, many people thought that this was an attack. So people were understanding that this was all some sort of an argument that Trump was using against Biden, and it might have an argumentative value. So again, it tells you that people might be understanding arguments differently than the theory tells you, or that their subjectivity in all these uh, argumentation, it's very important if you want to build machines or models that are, have actually to engage with people at some point, they should be able to understand how people are, argument, are doing arguments, which is different from the theory sometimes. If we look now at more uh, linguistics, matters, we can uh, find things like rhetorical devices, for instance, repetition. This is when you are uh, speaking about something and you, you, you say a claim, and then you repeat the same sentence again to increase the impact of what you're saying. This is something that it's been related to populist language, to more accessible language. It's something that Trump does a lot. He repeats his sentences one and another time. And um, here, if we look at the similarity between the sentences of these presidential debates, so it's just looking whether one sentence spoken by a candidate was very similar or, or the same to the next sentence, we find here that this is the average similarity score for the four candidates. We do indeed see that uh, Trump, but then followed by, by Biden, they tend to say sentences that are more similar to each other. 
If we look at a histogram of how they are distributed, this is a similarity score from zero, completely different, one, the same. Obviously, we find that most of them have a similarity score of zero because people don't tend to always say the same sentence all the time. But if we only filter those sentences here with the highest similarity score, and then we compare it to uh, the historical debates, the one I was talking about before, here ordered by year, what we find out is that the uh, number of sentences with the, well, the uh, pro proportion of sentence sentences with a high similarity score increases a lot in the recent years. So this tells you that this, um, this notion that more populist or more accessible language with things like repetitions to, to make uh, more claims is something that we have been noticing recently. And it's actually a trend that you can see that happens from the more historical debates that were more structured and a little bit more, more civil. It, it, it does, we recover the same trend and we see that it's actually happening. There's a similar thing. I was just talking about civility in, 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 in these debates, uh, something that was very notorious in the previous debates that they had a lot of interruptions. The speakers that will not let each other speak, uh, they were con constantly being interrupting each other. So here we are looking at the average number number of words per an, an uninterrupted speech. So this means like how much time they were talking until someone interrupted them or until someone's turn came. What we see it's very clear that in the oldest debates, they were speaking for a long time before someone was talking. While in this one, the average number of words is very, very short. It's like they were constantly being interrupted, or at least they had many turns. So again, this tells you how the debates and the quality of this course has changed in time when they started. And here on the right, we can look at a similar thing, which is the average number of words per sentence. So this tells you about, uh, well, the simplicity of the sentence or the complexity of, of the sentences spoken. And what we see is that Trump and Biden and more notoriously Trump, they tend to say the sentences with the, with the lower mean or lower median, while for instance, Harry as Harris and Pence spoke sentences that were much longer in general. And obviously it's something that it's been noted for, for particularly for Trump that he speaks very short sentences. And as we have seen before, sentences also that are very similar to each other. So he tends to use uh, all this, this type of language that's very accessible for, for other people. More on linguistics, we can look at other rhetorical uses, for instance, of pronouns. So it's known that in, 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 in political psychology or psychology in general, that the usage of pronouns tells you a, little, a lot about how you identify with uh, other groups. So if you talk a lot about you, obviously you want uh, about I, I want to draw attention to myself. If I'm speaking about they, I want to distance myself from someone else. And what you see is that, for instance, apparently uh, Trump and, and Pence, they tend to talk more about I, about themselves, while Joe Biden and Kamala Harris speak more about we, which could be maybe their party, or could be we as the people. Uh, it would be interesting to analyze this to say this is uh, maybe uh, a difference between Republicans and Democrats, maybe something about people being presently in power, like uh, would be Trump, or people who is going to be in power that they are. Uh, prospective president and vice president, and they speak more about we, about the people. So it would be interesting to analyze all of this in, in the history of political debates to see these trends. Similar things with other expressions like I will, I want, should. For instance, uh, Biden and um, um, Kamala Harris speak a lot about what they want to do, I will. Uh, Trump and Pence, what they want to do, I want. And very notoriously, Biden and a little bit less, Harris is talk a lot about what should be done or should happen. So it tells you again about very different ways of using rhetorics from these candidates. And finally, uh, drawing from theories of political theory, we know there's a lot of uh, research now about uh, fact checking, about how politicians might be saying facts are not completely true. There are tools like this one, Claim Buster, that wants to use computational techniques to automatically extract if things are facts or not, um, what are the things that, well, basically check them to, to, to see if they are true or not. They have built uh, like a whole system where you can monitor your claims and, and they can uh, have these claims spotted. It will tell you whether the claims are, are true or not. And then it will try to make a fact checker. So it tells you uh, what's, what's behind this supposed fact. 
Um, we can use this uh, fact checking technology uh, of this, which has been trained with natural language techniques and has been trained on political debates to tell you uh, which things of a debate, and this is from the US 2020, it's fact worthy, something that's worthy to check. Here, for instance, speaking about vaccines, we have uh, Trump was saying Pfizer is doing very well and we have numerous others. So this is something that's worthy of being checked because it looks like a fact, but it does not do very well with other things out of context, like Johnson & Johnson is doing very well, Moderna is doing very well. This is the same as this one, but it lacks the context to know what Moderna or Johnson & Johnson are in respect to Pfizer to also tell you about this. So these are all of things are imperfect and more research on, on these natural language techniques will help you, well, will help in general to uh, improve uh, these, these, uh, these analysis. So we can apply this fact check into the debates and we can see which uh, of the candidates have, they, they, they say more fact worthy sentences. So this is like a fact score. One is like a very clear fact series, something that's not a fact or anything in general. What we do see is that for instance, since like Mike Pence seems to be the person who says more and facts in general, while Donald Trump just followed not that far away from Biden, the one that doesn't seem to say sentences that have uh, that much of a fact score. And we can see some examples here in a more qualitative view. A very high uh, score fact is like, we had 10, 4, 4 million people in four month period, blah, blah, blah. It's very clear it has it's about numbers. It's something that you can check very easily. So it has a very high fact score. And you have something that has a very low one, which is this sentence that's not going to try to read because it's like a little bit all over the place. So it's not really saying anything. This is something that's clearly not a fact. And we have something in between that might be like, we got a lot of it done, which is, well, we don't really know what he was talking about. It's missing the context, but it could be a fact, could not be a fact, but it needs, again, the context and it needs more information to know what's happening here. And finally, another very used technique, it's been used a lot for marketing, for companies, sentiment analysis to know what, if something is positive or negative. What we see here is like minus one would be very negative sentiment, plus one very positive senti uh, sentiment, serious neutral. And this is the distribution of whatever they were saying. And we can see a little bit that skewed to the right towards positiveness. So it tends to be a little bit more positive and they are negative. And uh, notoriously, we see, for instance, that Kamala Harris is the one that's more positive in general. So this will be something interesting to see how it changes between, between uh, candidates. And if we check with historical debates, and in this case, we compare with the 2016 debates, we see that Trump in 2016 was much more negative than he was in 2020. So it, again, it seems like and this is something that was also known that it might be more negative at the beginning of his political career, but then he started to so play the game and be less negative as a politician in, in time. So it's all about text, but we can increase the complexity, the complexity of all this because the information that we have here is debate. So we have audio and we have video. So let's see what happens if we have audio. So we know the uh, audio and video can contain also non-verbal cues that can improve the prediction of these uh, machine learning models. We have irony, humor, pitch, facial expressions, all of these things could depend a lot on the pitch. And there are studies in political science that tells you that voters and politicians, they react differently to the vocal pitch of the person. For instance, in this paper, they found that the that men and women prefer to vote for male and female candidates with lower pitched voices. And when facing male opponents, candidates with lower voices won a larger vote share. This is very interesting because we know that then voice is going to have like a, a great impact in how we see things. There are uh, multimodal natural language processing techniques that analyze the audio in one, in one stream, then you have that can analyze the text signal in another stream, and then you put everything together at the end. And it gives you, for instance, in this case, an emotion taking into account also both the, the text and the audio features of, what you, of the utterance of the person. We did something similar in the, like in this case of the crowdsourcing. Remember that we gave them like two pairs of sentences and we were asking them to analyze how, how was the relation of the, of the argument between them. And we built multimodal text only and audio only models to see um, what was, how was the performance of these models. In a text only model, these are fairly easy, a simple uh, like pipeline that's very commonly used in natural language processing. It's just like a bird 
encoding, which is something like a Google algorithm that's very used in, in translation, for instance. For the audio, what we use is a much more complex algorithm that I'm not going to, to discuss, but we basically input a lot of features from the from the audio, like something about things about frequency, about the amplitude, about uh, many, many different signals. As you can see here, we put everything together, we pass it through the audio stream. And finally, we have the multimodal model in which we were putting one sentence and then the other sentence of the pair, both through the audio and the text modules. And at the end, we can coordinate everything and it gives us an answer. So we analyzed the, uh, the model performance of the audio text and multimodal. And one very interesting thing that we found is that the audio only model was performing very well, well, fairly, fairly well compared to the text one, only with the audio. So we we're not giving any information about the text. So it was at the, uh, classifying very well the neither relations, very close to one. The attack and support were not that good because it's a very complex task. And it's in general, there are no models that do it perfectly. But it was, if you notice, performing much better than the text only models. It was not receiving anything about the text, about the uh, linguistics, about the language even, we were not giving anything about that. And the audio only was able to classify better than the text. But with we used a multimodal model, we actually saw an increase even, uh, even more than just the audio only and, and the text only. We had a high increase in the classification, especially of the attacks, but also of the supports. So adding the audio is giving like very useful information to improve in these classifications. And we must ask ourselves how are these, uh, where is it all coming from? For example, is the, the pitch of the person who's always speaking? There are like some uh, studies that tell you about the vocal pitch that conveys more emotional expression, and people prefer different types of pitch. What we have here, uh, for instance, is like this is someone speaking, this is the amplitude of their voice, and here's the frequency of their voice here. What we find is that if they tend to go above their baseline by standard deviation, it means that they are more emotionally expressive. So they might be expressing more emotions. And we can see how much of these uh, emotions they are present during a debate. What we see, for example, for example, here is that if we look at a Trump in one of the uh, of debates, it's a segment on, on one of his town hall events, where he was going about more than 25% of his time above pitch. This was, this was a segment when they were speaking about COVID and they were telling, asking him about uh, if he had taken tests and if they were positive or negative, and he, he was getting very altered. And we can see here in the pitch how this was like a very high uh, emotional state for him while the, the, the moderator was in a normal state of around 9%. And if we compare it to another part of the segment, we see that he came back to a baseline of 9%, which means that he came back to normal, but in those specific, in that specific topic, he was very emotional. So we could analyze further whether the topics influence how the candidates are, are speaking and the emotional state of them. And if, I want to remember again about this uh, paper where they showed how different vocal pitches ha can influence the voters' behaviors. And to say that computational social science and ethics need to go hand by hand in this kind of studies, because if we, like Matt said at the beginning, what it's scary is about people using uh, machines and building machines and algorithms without actually taking into account the, the social science behind it. So if we don't take in, uh, into consideration all these things, we can reproduce the same forms of discrimination about, against people, maybe women with, diff, with higher pitches, for instance, and while at the same time we are trying to solve these things. So it might actually reproduce them. And just, yeah, we're, so. we're out of time. So also wanted to show finally that there are, uh, also we can add video on top of this and we can analyze how the, the find the expression of people in, in, in their faces. We will finally, uh, we will have a debate when the speakers are speaking, we find their faces, we can recognize them and then we can analyze the emotion on them. This has been used to analyze political debates to understand how the politicians react and how the voters react to the politicians' faces. And we can do, we can have videos uh, online that where the faces of the politicians are being found and we find their emotions. We can correlate them with the audio, we can correlate them with the text. And then we can have very useful information about how the politicians are speaking in, in debates about certain topics. Um, and again, but this is something uh, sort of dangerous if it's not used properly because it can be detrimental to democratic values of inclusiveness, transparency, transparency and non-discrimination if this is used with people or in other deliberations with other people without being 
uh, proper supervised by people and we let the uh, algorithms make the decisions for them. So yeah, just to conclude, I'm sorry, we're going a little bit overboard. <laughs> we have presented some examples, uh, some published, some unpublished, but you, well, we have borrowed methods from qualitative methods to more quantitative methods, mainly under the umbrella of computational social science. And you can see more of our work or, or contact us in, in the website. And yeah, mainly what we wanted to say is like, the distinction between purely qualitative and purely quantitative methods is a little bit more blurred now because we can because with these computational techniques we can analyze qualitative stuff that before was not we were not able to do in in ways that show a lot of promise for 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 this field we just will look forward uh, if you have any questions or suggestions and you want to continue speaking with us thank you all right, thank you so much. Uh, this is really fascinating talk um, and has um, stuff that could inspire many of the audience here. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so we have some questions um, in the chat box. Um, so starting from uh, Tony Tam. So he's asking more about some fundamental kind of theoretical bit here. So in the context of uh, augmentation mining, can you tell us a bit more about whether there is any empirical puzzle that may have motivated this line of research? Uh, so, with augmentation mining, um, the, let's say the, the, the aim of what people started, why they were interested in, in this thing, obviously, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very old field. So, there's been a lot of interest for like, forever in how people argument, how deliberations uh, are happening, how we can reach uh, a decision. There's been a lot of interest recently in how we can use machines to assist in these deliberations. So not to make the decisions for us, but to maybe uh, in our case, for instance, in democratic innovations, how we can use this uh, augmentation mining so maybe we have like a big deliberation of people maybe it's offline or maybe it's online it doesn't matter if finding ways to mine extract these arguments and then present them in a easy manner for people to understand in maps so instead of having like all this amount of information that you have to read a lot of things it's just like extracting what's the actual argument and maybe many people have said the same argument in different ways how we can summarize everything together let's put it together this is your argument and here you have all the possible combinations of premises that support or attack this and then you have like a big tree of arguments and you can go through it with people maybe in a deliberation event you can imagine like you have posits and people start putting like the arguments and how they connect with each other and it's like a very easy and understandable way for people to go from one premise to the other to finally reach a conclusion taking into account all the other arguments around it. Yeah, I think I'll just justify things, but it's a great question, Tony, because sometimes we're doing background research for implicit empirical questions that we have. And I think we're, so we intend to do some field experiments where we're trying to uh, take argument maps and employ them in deliberative venues and see whether it allows people to aggregate information in a more useful way so they're not just going back to the same arguments again and again which is a problem you see in deliberation or you have a problem one of the interesting things about using these argument mapping is that um, uh, we've tended to find that even where people are expressing the same argument because they haven't expressed it they feel annoyed by that so there's a question of how we can present information and, and actually are, identify arguments in a way that's consistent. And those are the kind of background questions and, and how it fits into the pipeline of work we're doing, I suppose. Hope that answers the question. Okay, so um, the other question in the chat box is from Professor Bo Huan. So fantastic talk regarding the example on augmentation mining. How did you reduce the biases in the data code from social media platforms, that's like crowdsourcing um, thing. So because like that, that's also my question. So I was initially wondering like, you know, and, and also you use that as like ground truth that compares other kind of voice-based um, and text-based uh, automated methods, right? So probably you can tell us about users' age, gender, occupation, anything like that. Yeah, in this case of the uh, crowdsourcing, we did not have access to that kind of data. 
because it's it, it was protected by the company. So we all this uh, the location, but they might be using a VPN or something like that. So the most of the information that we have was the country. So we could filter by the country, by the language that we were speaking. So we know we had a, a distribution of US uh, population, but that's all the information that we had. And obviously that's a, a source of bias because the people who are using the platform, we know obviously that they're not going to have, and um, they might have a more homogeneous, less social background. It's not going to be very heterogeneous or, or, or uh, representing the whole population. So it's a source of bias and we cannot do anything to actually uh, control the bias because that information is not available. That might be a source of why uh, we will find these uh, disagreements between the people. Um, what as ground truth, we were not using their annotations. So the ground truth were our annotations, which is obviously also a source of bias because we're doing it ourselves, but at least we were trying to do it drawing from the theory of argumentation, like what uh, philosophy is telling you, uh, telling if this is an argument or not and how are the relations between them. So these were our ground truths and how we assessed the annotations between them. There was one thing that we wanted to analyze, but we realized we didn't have like enough data that could be interesting would be how are people uh, mm, annotating these arguments, maybe uh, depending on, on the speaker. So if they have a bias against Trump or a bias against Biden, and that's very shown in their annotations, they might tend to uh, annotate as argument worthy, something that Trump said because they like Trump, maybe like the example that I said before. There's something that could be definitely a source of bias, but what we found more interesting here in this case at the end, it was that, especially this, we thought we would be able to find a very robust and um, with high agreement uh, data set. And what we found was something that was didn't have such, such high agreement, but we still found it very interesting because it's telling you how people are understanding these arguments. And it, that argumentation is actually a, a subfield of the field now. It might have a probabilistic uh, value. It might be not, that anything is not 100% a supportive argument. It might be, let's say, 80% supportive, 10% attacking, even if it sounds, uh, it doesn't sound obvious, but depending on how people view these arguments, there might be a probabilistic approach here that might be interesting to, to, to follow up on. Yeah, I think in, in general also, just to, just to follow up, I think it's a great question because the, the work on, on, on bias and, and, and sampling in crowdsourced or even extracted uh, data is just very naive. Like, I mean, it's uh, almost the way that we've talked, I mean, I, I say we as in the collective scholars have talked about um, these kind of big data, you know, sampling theory sometimes goes out the window when people are, are, are talking about these data. So I think it's a really important question. There are loads of potential avenues for research and improving it, whether it's about trying to understand how an annotator is understanding a task vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what you might have uh, expected, or whether it's about finding parameters that can actually, um, uh, you know, account for the missing information on gender that you were asking about or something like that. But that's something we're working on, really, um, and we're kind of learning from what we're doing about the different things that are going on, like Rafa said. Okay, so maybe, maybe this time I can just take the... Uh, advantage being a host right now. So I have some questions, so it's really interesting. So especially our audience might not have been exposed to argumentation mining. So I was also wondering like, so the text-based, like machine learning based, like argumentation mining, are they all like supervised learning or like unsupervised learning? And if it's supervised and, and it requires some training, some data set, and what could be the logic of like training? and then detect like argumentation things. And the other question is that, um, so I was, I found very interesting to see that, you know, the, um, the interruptions, interruptions in the debates and the historical change, and that's really remarkable. Like how can it really decrease the interruptions and the average words uh, before and after the, the interruption? So can you tell us a bit more about some, some data that you had and also how to, um how to so what is the heuristics um to take the number of you know words between interruptions and things because like as i think of it like how to define the interruptions in terms of the words and and what is the heuristics that you use for that um that could be fun so two two questions yeah thank you yeah the first one 
So uh, these uh, models that I was showing, they are supervised, so they all require uh, some training data. I'm not sure if I don't know of any like unsupervised model for these kind of tasks because they are pretty complex. So there are some for uh, emotion recognition or sentiment analysis and are taking like tweets with uh, emojis and stuff like that to to be unsupervised, but I don't know how like reliable they are. But for this kind of task, they are always unsupervised, uh, sorry, supervised. And one thing here is that they tend to be from data sets that scholars have annotated. And usually there are people who are very well aware of the theories of argumentation. They know them very well that they're, they're doing like a really big job annotating all these data sets. So that's where our source comes. Uh, Oh, and the other source would be maybe crowdsourcing techniques when you have more disagreements because people don't uh, really uh, agree with each other. So you have all these two sources of data. And the problem here is that they don't, in general, they don't match very well all these data sets because you have many different frameworks of argumentation that are based on different theories. So each author might be annotating them in their own framework and they sometimes, they, can, they don't really marry. Maybe some of them label it as support and attack other ones label them as pro and con. Then you have claims, premises, and major claims. You have all sorts of annotations. So there's also a problem of the field itself that's not really agreeing on what, like typical philosophy. They don't really they have all these typical, all these different theories, and they don't really agree which one is the best one. I don't know if that answers your question on how it's done. Yeah. And for the second one of the interruptions, yeah, that's a very good question. I wanted to to have said more about that. We're running out of time, so this interruption thing is actually telling you two things so what we did was you have the uh the segments of the people speaking you know when one is when one person speaking and then it jumps to the next one so you can you obviously know when which is a speaker of each segment but what it was to count the number of words between when one, one, one person could speak and interrupt it this could mean actually two things it could mean that they were interrupted so it actually happened that they were in the middle of a sentence and then someone has jumped in and in the transcript you have a different person so you label that as an interruption so you know that someone uh, has stopped speaking for someone else to do it or it might be might just be like a natural stop of someone speaking because it, it was the end of their turn so we were speaking for five minutes and then they stopped it is we did not did, did that at this point but it should be possible to differentiate whether it is an interruption or it is an end of a segment so this uh, trend that tells you that the segments become much shorter in recent debates, it tells you one of these two things, that they were either very, they were interrupting each other a lot, or they just were short. It's a little bit of both things. Because if you look at the historical debates, you notice that it's not only that they don't interrupt themselves, it's that, that the segments are very long and they speak for five minutes and then the next person speaks and nobody says anything during that time. So. It's a little bit both about the structure of the debates and also the civility on how much they interrupt each other. Oh, thank you. And another question. So, so I'm reading this question because there are other sources that have live videos. So I, I should read, I think. So the, the Paul Clark asked the question, question on all your part, excluding people who are not understanding nature, nature of test etc. The nature of in engagement in public debate is that many people do so when lacking information or comprehension of the debate. Therefore, could excluding these people be excluding an important group leading to an incomplete picture of what's going on? Understand? Yeah, so I think I, I can say a little bit about that. It's a really good, it's a really good question. And, and the, the answer to it is yes, it could be excluding an important group. That's, that's absolutely right. Um, I suppose it depends. Like this is kind of very new research, and I think for the for the crowdsourcing, for example, it was it was you know we were kind of what was important for us at that point was to get a, a, a clear annotation that's coherent across uh, enough people. So it made sense, for example, if people were speeding through the task or whatever, to exclude them uh, for various reasons. So we just didn't have enough information information on why people were not doing. Uh, so many to, to understand whether it's what you're saying, which probably was some of it, or whether it was uh, some other way of trying to cheat the system and, 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 and make quick money. Um, but at least we had some reliable annotations. If we do it again, we might do it in a, in a slightly different way to try and account for that. But overall, I mean, I think it's one of the real problems for social science uh, is, you know, they're, they're called hard to reach groups for a reason. So these people who are not engaging in debates are hard to reach. 
And obviously we need to think of interesting techniques to try and triangulate basically so that maybe if we do uh, set up one study in one way, we can get a certain type of information, but then we have to put, try and triangulate with other methods to try and uh, you know, answer that question that you've asked essentially. Okay, thank you. And um, Jacob Richard Thomas asked, you know, I saw you were focusing on speeches in the end, but in terms of helping us better understand interactions, I was wondering if you have discussed on how to use these methods to collaborate with the conversation analysis and to analyze other parameters they are often interested in. For example, turn taking modularities, so modulations of voices, timber, and pitching. I move on gesture, body language to better understand micro interactions, particularly within con consequential cases of courtroom, legislative uh, branches, and diplomatic exchanges. I think uh, uh, it's a really good question. So you can say a little bit about, about, about the, the different uh, 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 features that you can extract there. but. It, we're actually even more ambitious than that. We're hoping to actually do this with 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 very ordinary citizens deliberating in in mini publics and that. So uh, uh, absolutely, all the other domains that you've mentioned there, Jacob, are exactly the kind of things that we'd like to apply this to, and and look at other features and and all the ones that you've explained. I think we started off with this with with these debates because that's where we had uh good data essentially and it was a good place for us to start learning about the techniques uh and and, and develop them but that's absolutely the where we want to go over the next couple of years is to try and apply this in in, in these areas and, and and see what's more interesting so you've already given some ideas there i hadn't even thought about in terms of eye movement and things like that although is that captured by the the thing you with the uh, eye the movement uh I, i'm not aware of any uh like models or algorithms to capture a movie, it might be, it, it's probably possible. It might be possible. There's definitely stuff for gesture and, yeah. and body language that we have not explored at the moment, but we have actually been also suggested by other people in other talks that it might be interesting to analyze, how, particularly politicians, how they move their hands and the gestures that they are all very well, uh, like, performed, you know, like, they they their thoughts they're not just always random so how these things correlate with other uh, emotion expressions that we might find but we have not done it at the moment right it's something that we are definitely thinking on okay so perhaps last question so Yao Tao Li uh, asked uh, thanks for the talk I was I wonder if the method for augmentation could also be used to extract predication strategies, for example, positive and negative characteristics, qualities uh, attributed to subjects. I'm not sure. Yeah, don't fully understand. Yeah, what, what he means by predication strategies. If you could clarify. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's just uh, like a positive or negative elements uh, which you can identify through the uh, public talks and statement or policies, you know, like a kind of link to the sentimental analysis a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so linking the argumentation mining and sentiment analysis essentially. There is, yeah. um, we believe that there is a correlation, there must be a correlation between the sentiment of, of, of a sentence or whatever they're saying with the uh, argumentation uh, analysis. For instance, if you are giving a premise that attacks something that someone else said so someone gives a claim and you say okay yeah this is not true because i have another reason so i'm attacking that argument you might be saying this like phrasing the sentence with a different sentiment than if it's something that supports another reason so it might have like a more negative connotation or it might have a more positive connotation if it's supportive the same with the pitch you might be attacking this uh, argument with a different page or different frequency in your voice that if you're supporting it. So there is for sure a correlation. I don't think anybody has analyzed this yet, but we actually want to include these uh, sentiment or emotional features also into the text for the argument annotation to see if this actually is improving the annotation at the same time that we have found that the audio is improving. And we want to see if the sentiment is also improving that. I mean, that's answering your question. 
I, I was just going to say, it's made me think quite a bit because I think there could be alternative hypotheses as to, as to, as to whether it's going to be more positive or negative whether ident when you're identifying an argument or not. So it's definitely something we should look into. I, I, hadn't, I have to be honest, I hadn't really thought about it in that way before. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, if there's no questions, so I, I have a question about uh, Matt, um, because nobody asked about your research too. So, so participatory budget. So I found like many of the countries that you present were from either Latin America or Europe. So is there any like Asian countries um, that uh, have some cases for like part participatory budget, either successful or fa failures, anything to add yeah. about it? There are several, and, and, and one of the reasons I wasn't able to include them in my study is that like, there's been waves of dispersion of this, of, of this phenomenon. There's, there's over 2,000 cases, and I only studied 30, but those are the 30 where I had good data and all the key conditions. There were a couple of cases in Korea that I came close to doing this, so Seoul has a very strong um, uh, participatory budgeting program that's been there for many years. Obviously, there are issues because a lot, like I, I was, I was kind of, I and mean, this is something that maybe machines could help us with at some point through translation. But I, because of the way that I was doing the study, it was very much limited to English, English language sources, which obviously is a complete bias and one that we're always trying to deal with. But there are several Asian cases. A lot of them tend to be um, slightly different cases because they're either. Uh, state-sponsored cases are cases that inv involve a corporate partner often in, 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 in places, but there are cases on mainland China, there are cases in, that, are, that are actually quite interesting and they have their own uh, variances on, on, on a normal, um, uh, on, the, on the kind of traditional way of doing participatory budgeting, but they're quite successful and innovative in, 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 in other ways. But cer certainly I would, have, I would like if I can do this again, hopefully to have uh, the data available. But again, because we're crowdsourcing this data, there are biases in, and, and this is something that we're trying to deal with in, in the sense that particularly it's dominated by European and North American um, uh, sources because a lot, a lot of the time with some exceptions, that's where you know, a lot of the money for research is. And uh, that, that, can, that can mean you know, various things about what actually gets picked up when we have information on. So it's designing good studies to do, to good, designing good, Research having good research designs to do the cross national comparison is 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 difficult. But Participedia is a good place to go to just try and find case studies and see things that are happening in different parts of the world. It is still a bit more ecumenical than uh, let's say some of some of the stuff that we've done. But I was basically because I had like a lot of that data was over was over a thirty year time period. It was really cases that had been happening for a long time. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any question from the uh, audience? Okay, I think we are right on time. So thank you again so much for your presentation. Um, lots of good stuff there. I, I'm sure that this will help our audience um, get a sense of CSS and, and uh, maybe use some ideas that you present for their research as well. So, so thank you so much and have a have a wonderful now now it's afternoon right it's going to be afternoon there okay soon <laughs> soon yeah good okay. morning yeah wow. okay no it's good thanks so much guys we thank really you. appreciate it thanks for the great questions okay and discussion. okay thank you thank you bye bye, -bye. thank you